Well, hello! This is the second part to a much longer reaction. If you haven't seen them yet, links to them are in the description as well in the co top corner of the video. Now, with that out of the way, let's get this thing started then, shall we? From the thematic importance that he carries, to his relation to other secret bosses, to why he is Cat. So moving what? on. He makes himself known after coming out of his dumpster home and notices Chris, which is pretty big news to Spampton as he knows that Chris is a lightener and therefore has a heart-shaped object or a soul. And in one of many moments in this chapter where Chris does act more on their own, they seem genuinely kind of freaked out at the sight of this dude. I mean, granted, that I, I think everybody was when they first met Spampton, though the guy is a little freak. Spampton, seeing himself and Chris at this moment with them being alone and being rather spot on with the idea of them having lost control of their life, possibly alluding to the soul overriding the control of Chris has over themselves, proposes a deal to them and implies that he knows a way that him and Chris can change that fate, that being a certain hyperlink blocked and becoming big shots. And for this to happen, all Chris has to do is just show him their soul. And this is where the first fight with Spampton happens. We get a little glimpse of Spampton's past in this fight as he says that he used to already be a big shot, but that now he needs a bit of generosity. And the fight comes down to pretty much taking Spampton's deal and negotiating with him in various ways. Once you reach full mercy with him, the fight ends and he tells you to meet him back at the trash zone and to visit his shop alone. Which, if you do want to see his deal through, is where you go next, and... Alright, I want to just take a moment to talk about this room, and specifically this door. Does nobody find this fucking strange? What, you mean the, the door that's literally just leaning up against what is quite a, literally a pile of garbage? Yeah, it is pretty weird, but given how weird Spampton is, it's completely on track. There's a great door in the middle of this room just sticking out from all the garbage, and when you enter it, you see a wall behind Spampton that has no business being there, and a phone to the right just sort of sitting there in the darkness, ringing at a specific point in the song that's playing. And, I mean, are we just going to completely completely forget the fact that, you know, the the wall just kind of fades out of existence going to that one area with the phone. It's not really something that I can get much out of, and the weird glitchiness of this shop lines up a bit with the messed up tiles that you see throughout Cyber City, and especially in the trash zone, but it's just... I, I mean, look at this. What am I even supposed to say? Like, I remember when I first played this chapter over a year ago, and the sheer confusion that I felt when I saw this shop for the first time has not really changed one bit. As much as I try to make sense of the things going on in this game, I think with Spampton you just kind of have to go with it at this point. But the next important thing to touch on is his dialogue when you're talking with him in the shop. When you select Our Deal, he lays out the plan for what he wants you to do. Go into the basement in the Queen's Mansion and find something in there, particularly an empty disc that will make both him and Chris big, using the keygen that you buy from him to get past the encryption. When you select About You, he goes more into his past of how he used to be the email guy before becoming big, and also actually alluding to Jevil as that damned clown around town as he wants to surpass him and reach for the big one. So not only is there an established history between him and Jevil, but in regards to what the big one might be referring to, it could be in reference to the Neo body, or just a higher level of power closer to that of a Lightner, or perhaps something even more powerful? Again, just my best assumption. Surpassing Gaster! But it's when you select Knight that things get especially fucking weird. He actually alludes to knowing something about the Knight before getting cut off and apologizing to something off screen, which could be the Knight or something that probably just stopped him from revealing things that he shouldn't, before uttering probably my favorite fucking line in this entire game so far. But you'll only get to select this option once, as after you do, it's replaced with the Friends option. And selecting that, you get spammed in assuring Chris that they already are friends and that they don't need anything. No easels, no CRTs, no... Mike. Mike. Before cutting himself off and telling Chris to not believe anything they see on TV. Very likely foreshadowing for Chapter 3's main antagonist, but that's a whole other can of worms, although it does continue the trend that Jevil said in Chapter 1 of foreshadowing the next chapter's antagonist. Just much more directly this time around. <laughs> and finally, selecting Fear, we get the most bizarre outcome. Spampton assures that there's nothing to be afraid of except... Well, he gets cut off as a voice suddenly starts crying for help, asking if anyone can hear them. Before Spampton comes to again and says that they didn't hear anything, but it sounded like they were talking to you. And while there's not much in the way of confirming this completely, this does line up very closely with the unused script from Chapter 1, and if these two things are to be connected, then it certainly makes me wonder how much more this supposedly unused script is going to bleed into the actual game. 
Oh god, could that potentially be Des leaking through? Oh, oh no. In fact, in the Japanese translation of this line, it apparently literally does just quote the Japanese translation of unused, so there's that, I suppose. Okay. Which, speaking of, this is one of only two things I really need to mention about the game internally in Chapter 2, but the unused script is updated in this chapter, now having a new set of text for each variable. This time it continues from Chapter 1's version of the script, as the voice assumes that nobody can really hear them. In fact, they're not really sure if they can hear themselves because of how dark and quiet it is, yet they swear that sometimes they can hear what they best describe as... ...some sort of scratching. But that's all we can get from this version of the script, and as of now, that is the extent to what we know about the character that is speaking all of this dialogue and this function. It's still really anyone's guess what's going on with this unknown character or what that scratching noise could even be. But for the that's moment, really that's where the new script ends, so let's just continue on. You eventually get to Queen's Mansion and to the room with the encryption. You use the keygen to unlock it, and just like with Spampton's shop, Chris, on their own accord, tells the others to stay behind and let Chris go on their own to the basement. And I still can't get over just how fucking bizarre this area is. Even after my first and second playthrough of this chapter, it's such a tonal whiplash. Yeah. Completely empty halls, several rooms with mostly empty chests, these weird things to jump at you and also stare at you if you're idle for long enough, which is weird enough on its own already. Yeah, those things were so creepy. But I always thought of them as, like, weird knockoff chain chomps, but instead of being a chain chomp, it's an outlet. And whatever the fuck this is... So, if you go in this room oh, where the teacup ride for the basement that. is, if you run to the end of the room, then to the other end, and back before the ride makes its way up, you'll see this face appear for a brief moment. This was the sole exception to my theory that every all caps thing in the files was related to just stuff in the menus, as internally, the sprite of the smile is called image friend, and the corresponding object is device friend. Its only function as an object is to appear, gradually lessen in opacity, and then disappear, and there's nothing else regarding its function in the code. You know, I can't... Jeez, okay. Now, I, I never saw that before, but given, you know, the eyes, I can't help but imagine that that's potentially like Spamton following you and just watching you complete it uh, and like get the disc and all that sort of stuff. But man, that face. Ugh. Aside from every other file that uses all caps, this is the only one that you can actually encounter in the playable game beyond Goner Maker or the menus. So what or who the hell is this? With the context of just chapter two, we have absolutely no fucking clue. It could be Spampton. It's probably not, but it could be. Oh, I didn't know the could eyes be are, are reversed. Mike character that Spampton was alluding to. It could be whatever the next secret boss is, if it's not Mike, or maybe it's even just Gaster himself. Who fucking knows? But if looking at it solely oh, from a God, meta perspective, picture. maybe this makes more sense to fit in this group of all caps files that it might initially seem? When you think about it, this object is still out of bounds, it's unreachable, and its only purpose realistically is to just fuck with the player and catch them off guard. Hell, naming it friend probably plays into that. While it could be referencing course, yeah. that this is someone that spammed in or some other character knows, there's no way it's not named that for the purpose of just freaking people out more, referring to this as a friend in a very ominous way. I do have some other ideas as well for how this fits into the whole meta side of things, but I think I'll save that for just a bit later. But that is actually all the all caps files that I could find in the game, though we still have quite a bit to go over in chapter 2, so let's keep going. You shut Let's down go. the force field, go through this nightmare which I managed to survive first try in this playthrough because I am so good at video games and I, I did not. It took me like, I think five or six times to go through that. That was- After going through a very ominous railroad, you find yourself in a room with many empty openings, save for the very last one which bears some resemblance to Metaton Neo's body. And this is where you get the empty disc. You can also talk to Swatch after getting the disc to ask about the basement, to which he just fucking gaslights you. But you go back <laughs> yeah. to Spamton's shop with the disc, which is where he gives you the next step in his plan. Give the disc to him so that he can transfer his hyperlink blocked, which in this case, and for a good portion of mentions of hyperlink blocked, I want to say refers to control or something related to it that would be spoiling something if said hyperlink was not blocked. Once you go through with the transfer, he then wants you to go back to the basement and put the disc back where you found it. He does warn you, however, that doing the transfer will close his shop permanently. Which makes sense, since if you do the transfer, then... Yeah. Oh. Yes. The screen always freaked me out. 
it, it's so subtle, but the thing is, it's not like this only happens immediately after transferring, but you can still go back to the shop after this, and it's just empty. Like, there's no reason why I should be able to come back to see the screen again, yet it feels like this reminder of what you did, in a way. That, and it does line up a little bit more visually with the grey door, so perhaps this is how this place looked like before Spamton set up shop here? I'm not really sure, but it did stick out to me a lot, especially on a first playthrough. Moving on, you do as Spamton says, and you put the disc back in the Neo body in the basement, and... Nothing happens. Nothing happens. That is, until you go about halfway back through the room with the tracks... As Spamton Spam Neo comes Neo! to life. He's happy with this newfound power, yet he still notices these strings holding him back, realizing this body still isn't strong enough to make him truly free. And this is when he turns to Chris to try to take their soul from them in an attempt to get even more power, to which... While Chris seems a bit disoriented, they don't make an effort to really stop him or go into any defensive stance, weirdly enough. Oh god, can you imagine if, like, Spamton actually did get it's Chris's soul, if it actually is Chris's soul, but then it turns out he gets absolutely, like, blasted by the fact that the soul was controlling Chris, so he's now even, like, further underneath somebody else's thumb than he already was. Spam then is stopped by Rousey and Susie, and then cue the Spam to Neo fight, where we get the first instance in Deltarune of the soul's color changing, in this case to yellow, being a parallel to Metatense fights in Undertale. Generally, I can't get too much about the fight other than some particularly bits of dialogue that do stick out. There's at least another potential allusion to the next main antagonist, with the mention of Cathode screams, Mike is mentioned again, Spamton directly mentions Heaven, and he makes a lot of effort to try to get Chris to hand their soul over politely, but particularly asking if they want to be a heart on a chain their whole life rather than what is, at least in Spamton's eyes, becoming bigger and closer to freedom. Now, whether you attack him or spare him, the outcome after the fight stays the same, but the things that happen at the end of the fight do change. When you attack him, he scolds you for thinking that depleting his HP would do the trick, and tries to transform into Spam the next before just fucking going kaboom. <laughs> yeah. But the much more unsettling option comes from sparing him. If you decide to cut all of his strings down to the very last one keeping him up, he takes it as you actually trying to gift him his freedom despite the threat of killing them just earlier. He finally realizes that success comes from not just determination, but the power of friendship, and gets ready for his last string to be cut before... He falls. The game then cuts back to a much more resigned Spamton, realizing he really has done everything he could, even if it didn't work out, and figures that if he's done his part, then he can at least be of use to the fun gang, and you get whatever item you get from him depending on how you did the fight, and the his shadow maker, crystal. Yeah. This shadow crystal, when used in the cyber world, shows a brief glimpse of the computer lab, similar to how the first one briefly showed the unused classroom. And in the light world, as a shard of glass, using it shows a glimpse of Susie glaring coldly at Chris through the glass, when in reality she's smiling and just flipping them off or something. Shortly after though, when the fun gang is about to leave the basement for good, Susie stops and she has a moment of just genuinely wondering what the fuck just happened. Rousey tries to shrug it off as just corrupted data that shouldn't be given too much thought, and Susie notices Chris's expression and asks if they're doing alright. And this is one of the most standout examples of the potential dissonance between Chris and the player, as you can say yes, but Susie will feel like Chris doesn't really mean it if you pick this option, with Rousey simply passing it off as Chris not wanting the group to worry about them. But picking no will have Chris yell, which would be a first thus far in the game for them, and Rousey tries to comfort them to get their mind off of it. It goes without saying, there is a lot of discussion about what people think Chris really feels in regards to Spamton. Even by Chapter 2's standards, I can't say Chris really acts on their own as much as they do in any scenes that involve Spamton, and it could be boiled down to a lot of things. We know Chris has a tendency to obey random requests, like there's this interaction with Braddy in Chapter 1 where she recounts on how Chris just got her, Asriel, and other friends of theirs a bunch of food just because they were asked to, so it could be just common courtesy, despite them also having a tendency to be a bit of a silly trickster from time to time. <laughs> but there's also the interpretation that Chris really did see Spamton as a friend, or at least saw a lot of themselves in him, like he saw a lot of himself in Chris, which would line up especially well with the outcome for sparing him, as there's definitely a sort of parallel to draw between the strings that were holding Spamton back and the whole situation with us being the metaphorical strings holding Chris back. A sort of reminder that even if they were to cut those strings for good, that it wouldn't be sustainable for them. 
Especially when you consider the weight that the soul is given with it having the fate of the world and what have you. <laughs> yeah. I'd say there also might be a third interpretation and that's... I, I don't know, maybe Chris is actually just kind of scared of Spamton in general? Like, they don't look comfortable around him. They often walk back a few steps, they don't bother to defend themselves when their soul is about to get taken from them, which would be a sign of them being okay with the idea of it, or them just being genuinely in terror. And even in Spamton's shop, the option for leaving is just called escape. It might lead into them being afraid of becoming Spamton as well, that they don't want to become that desperate, and that they do see themselves in him, but not in a good way, or one that would really warrant them seeing him as a friend, but oh, more like a cautionary tale. Okay. There's a lot of ways to look at it, and this dynamic between Spamton and Chris is one of the reasons why there's just so much fucking depth to Spamton as a character, as he by far has some of the strongest impact we've seen on Chris, and I think it's definitely worth mentioning, because if a secret boss can leave that kind of impact on our main character here, and knowing the kind of information that secret bosses appear to have access to, it does seem relevant to understanding the game from a meta perspective as well. But I can't say for sure. Yeah, that's the thing, like, I, I, I secretly hope, and I generally do, that at some point, like, we the player actually get to a chance to talk with Chris. Like, either, you know, some sort of, like, plot shenanigans happens and the soul is like forcefully removed from Chris, but we're given the chance to actually communicate with them instead of just controlling their actions. And maybe even like in one of these like shop-like interfaces so you can see them like, you know, up, up close and personal. And just to see like their whole view on everything that's happened, like what they think of the choices we've made, because I mean, depending on how meta you want to get into it, like we the player ourselves like, it, it wasn't so much our choice to take control of Chris as it was we got the game, and when we got the game, we were in control of Chris. It's like, it's like, it, like our control of Chris isn't malicious. I think that would be the right word to use. And there's the idea that we're... We're taking advantage of Chris in this... What you could call a very... A dubious state, I think you could call it, where something happened to Chris where either their soul is being controlled or this soul that's in them was implanted somehow and that's what's controlling them, like against their will, and then we just swoop in and we start pulling the strings. Like, I would, I would absolutely love if we got the chance to actually talk with Chris about this. Maybe it would probably be near the end of the game, but just to like either like smooth things out, say, hey, we're both on the same team here. I'm sorry if you have the, uh, like, I'm sorry for making you do some of these more horrible things if you did in fact do them. Yeah, that, that, that would be nice. Like that would be like, I pretty much, I think, and everybody knows this. I think we can all pretty much say that Deltarune is going to be a good game unless like, uh, Toby and his team just absolutely drop the ball and never pick it up again. But that would be just the absolute cherry on top if we could do that. Because I remember something actually sort of similar in XCOM uh, The Bureau. Um, it's not one of the best XCOM games. It's like they they modeled it more off of like uh, like uh, like Mass Effect with like it's squad it's a squad based shooter instead of a like instead of a tactics game. But in the end of the game, like, uh, throughout the entire game, you play it in, like, a third-person view behind your the main character. I'm forgetting what his name is at this point. But it's revealed that you're actually controlling him, and, like, the th uh, you're, like, you were this invisible psychic alien that was controlling them, and but you were controlling them because you had amnesia and you w thought you were him. And the third person view was literally you being over his shoulders using your like invisible psychic tentacles to like control his limbs and stuff. I remember when I first saw that, it absolutely blew my mind. But I had never seen a game do that before at that point. And that absolutely blew me out of the water. So, I mean, just, uh, just the chance that we could, you know, talk to Chris and potentially apologize for all the, um, no mental harm that we put them through like that would just be that would be one that would be great either way god that's finally everything about spamton at least for <laughs> when he is actively present in chapter two safe for weird route but i'll i'll get there
Well, yeah, Weird Rider right is his own kettle of fish. That's very meta, like how Jevil casually referred to HP before his fight. I do think there's definitely a lot of stuff that does show he knows more than most other characters do about Deltarune's nature. He knows of Jevil, he's directly hinted at the next main antagonist, and at this Mike character that we don't know much about other than Mike being a former close associate of Spamton's. He's had a different character likely speak through him, and this is most commonly believed to be the character from the Unused Strings, and his goal pretty much was Which to reach a level of power that death. ultimately would have required the soul, or our control, in order to achieve that. While not so direct, I think the idea of a character trying to literally be you and reach your level of control is pretty fucking significant, and with the motif of control going very much without saying at this point, it does still continue the trend of these secret bosses knowing a little more about how things really work compared to other characters. Yeah. I guess there's also something to be said about the fact that he's a secret boss that also is a shopkeeper, given that Undertale has placed emphasis on a character like Gerson being immune to the player by sheer virtue of being a shopkeeper, and again, the whatever this is that happens when you have have spammed and transferred to the disc. I mean, again, I, I very much envision the fact that that's very much because, you know, all the characters in this Dark World specifically are either, like, technology or some sort of software program. So, you know, that could very much be it. Maybe there's something of note about that. But really, it's a lot easier to look into his dialogue in the context of lore and in relation to characters like Chris, Noel, or Des, while Jevil was a bit more blatant about his understanding that he was in a game and that knowledge making him feel like the only free one. Although, the thing with Jevil is that he's alluded to the theme of your choices not mattering. Like, if you refuse to do something with him, he says, how could you refuse a game that you're already playing, and stuff of that sort. <laughs> okay. He gives off the impression that while he knows he's in a fabricated reality, he can indulge in that and let himself be free, just enjoying whatever weird, fucked up ride the world has in store for them. Spamton, obviously, is not like this. His whole no, thing was just much. to gain more and more power to reach beyond heaven and reach a level of control alike to or even exceeding ours. If absolutely anything, I think the closest I can get to finding an equivalent for him breaking the fourth wall outright like Jevil did with mentioning HP is actually in the fact that he's so blatantly aware of the soul and what it's capable of. There isn't another boss in the game that really focuses on it quite like Spamton does, and on top of that, the way he manipulates the presentation of the battle system also really adds on to that. Yeah, that, again, that, yeah, that is sort of the deal. Because unlike, you know, in Undertale, like... Souls came up, your soul came up pretty often in, in like, in, in conversation when it came to Delt, uh, Undertale, I should say, just because, you know, it was a physical thing that the monsters could f physically capture, you know, put in the jar, use its power to break the gate and escape. But apart from, like, Ralze talking about, like, in battle and stuff like that, Spanton's the only one that's actually, you know, talked about the soul or actively like, referred to it. There's also the fact that the soul color changes, which I think on a meta level is pretty significant, yeah. because it does make me ask a lot of questions. For one thing, why only now? Why only in this fight, and why does this never happen anywhere else in the game? What conditions have to be met in order for the color of the soul to change? I've seen some theories about this that I was initially willing to believe, but I feel like more often than not they depend way too much on Undertale rather than thinking about Deltarune by itself. Not that Undertale has no weight in any of this, but consider. Every time the soul color changed in Undertale, it was often because of the boss you were fighting. When it turned to blue, that was Papyrus's attack. When it turned to green, that was Undyne's doing. When it turned to purple, that was Muffet's doing. The only sort of exception is when it turns yellow, since that was thanks to Alphys' help, but regardless, the soul color never changes on its own. It's always thanks to someone else, either for your benefit or to limit you in some way. And given that Spamton Neo is using the body of Metaton, or Metaton Neo, and, you know, during Metaton's fight, it's are the only times when you your heart turns yellow and changes position so it can shoot. Maybe. Maybe it's just sort of some residual from the body that's kind of affecting the soul. And the theory I often hear in Deltarune's case is that because Spamton was using Metaton Neo's body, that the soul remembered something about it and that made it turn yellow by itself. But the thing is, if the soul is supposed to be the player, then I don't remember getting the input for it to turn yellow. It just did that on its own. I couldn't control that. So it leads me to maybe two guesses. The first one that I feel less inclined to believe, but still could be possible maybe, is that it relates to Chris and their understanding of souls. While we don't know too much about Chris, what I can say for certain is that they definitely do have a pretty decent grasp on how to keep us out of their business if they feel the need to. 
Yeah, given that they can physically rip us out of their chest. They have a very convenient birdcage for that, and while I don't know why that cage would have been there well before the player came into the picture, it does tell me that they have had some awareness of the mechanics of souls in Deltarune's world well before our perceived beginning of the story. So, perhaps, somewhere in all of that research that Chris has done on them, there is something that relates to the color of the soul being able to change in certain situations. But, as you can tell, that required me to do a bit more reaching. So, the other interpretation that I felt more confident in honestly ended up being pretty simple. Two words. Divine, Divine intervention. intervention! And I know this is gonna sound kind of ridiculous, but hear me out. So I guess this could play into the whole, you know, uh, device theory about us playing on a device or something, but they could, could- Are you saying it could literally be just an outside command chasing, changing the soul? Spamton is one of a few characters in the game who has a pretty strong connection to Gaster. We also, also literally does keep have a connection to Gaster that was made at the beginning of the game, and he is overseeing our behaviors both in-game and even in the menus. He gives us the prompt to either continue or give up whenever we get a game over, so clearly whenever we lose any battle or our HP in general, he is the one that has to handle that situation when it pops up. Now, to not get too ahead of myself, as I haven't summarized Spamton's backstory yet, we do know that he has likely been in communication with Gaster, but that communication was ceased at some point. And to not go too deep into Theory Chaos yet, all that I know I can say theory with complete chaos. certainty is that Gaster, as a rather powerful force in this game, plays a big role in why we even exist or can persist in Deltarune's world through the soul, which is integral to the game's battle system. And we know that Spamton's whole thing is that he does what he does because he's trying to become big again and to meet or even exceed the power of a Lightner, ultimately through the acquisition of our soul. So, what would a being with powers and a presence that is eldritch in nature do when he sees that one of his former associates is trying to break the order of things and could pose a threat to the player and, by extension, the fate of the world? Here! Superpowers! <laughs> You stop everything for a moment, and give the player an advantage, and get them acquainted with it before letting them continue on. Yes, I know that basically saying that the soul changing partially because of Gaster sounds incredibly contrived, and honestly, I am ready for this theory to be completely steamrolled over. I mean, you never know. You never know. <laughs> I try to be very careful with my references to him and what he might be involved in, because really you could say Gaster is involved with anything, and it might have the slightest basis to it because of how little we know about him. So I'm not going to say that this is a very strong or even remotely foolproof interpretation, but it feels simple and relevant enough to the circumstances of this specific proof interpretation we know about him. So I'm not going to interrupt for the soul-changing circumstances of Sorry, this- Sorry, I had to go back and I was just checking, because I could have sworn I blinked and I saw Rousey's appearance change. Uh, it wasn't, I think I was just seeing things. ...specific fight that, unless we get any proper explanation for the soul changing colors that is more detached from him, I can't really think of a better one at the moment. But I don't want to ignore this detail either, because given the emphasis placed on us being this soul, I think it's definitely important enough to give some time to. The only other possible lead we have about the soul color changing is that it only changed to yellow once Spampton started using specifically blue attacks, which before that point and after that point have never appeared in any other fight. This could at least imply that maybe the soul was able to change on instinct upon seeing an obstacle that its normal mode wouldn't be able to overcome, so perhaps it is simply able to adapt to situations like that on the fly, but only when it deems itself necessary to, and that's why it never shows up in any other fight. But similarly, it could just be that if my divine intervention theory is somehow true, that Gaster saw spammed in using those attacks, knew that it would be impossible to overcome normally, and decided to give the player the yellow soul advantage in response. I think it could go either way really, because we just barely know anything about how souls work in Deltarune specifically, or what conditions have to be met for the soul to change colors. But that's all I can really say on that for now. Either way, this finally leads into what you're able to learn about Spamton after his fight from Swatch and from the Addisons. Addisons, that's what they're called, I completely forgot! Going back to Swatch, he gives some insight on the basement robot if you pick the appropriate option, stating that it was the embodiment of a Lightner's dream. Using Dark World logic, we can probably assume Swatch was basically a personified MS Paint, so we essentially learned that the robot was in fact a drawing of Metaton's ideal body that never really went anywhere, <laughs> and it was left in the basement. Spamton learned about this, and knowing that it was made from a Lightner, tried to use it to fulfill his own goals. But it's when you return to the Trash Zone that you finally learn Spamton's backstory proper. He was a former Addison selling his own products much like the others, but for some reason they never really hit or went anywhere. 
Despite this, he showed great charisma, being sure that some way or another he'll make it big, and that is exactly what he did after enough desperation and making the right phone call. Or perhaps being called by the right person. Either way, he'd end up on the phone all the time, and that's when his products finally started to skyrocket. As a consequence, however, the Addisons felt that they were no longer needed and so stopped communicating with him. And eventually, that success would run out, even after moving into the Queen's mansion. Suddenly, the thing that was helping him just disappeared. He would start praying to that robot he found in the basement trying everything he could to bring back that thing that made him successful to no avail. And eventually, he was evicted and stripped of any renown that he might have had before. However, when one of the Addisons went to check on him on the day of his eviction, he wasn't there, save for a phone left hanging from what must have been the middle of a conversation. The Addison could still hear something on the other end, but when he put the receiver to his ear, Just... he heard nothing but garbage noise. Which, as I mentioned much earlier in the series, is specifically what the flavor text describes the smile that OGG soundbite as in Chapter 2, when you use the cell phone in the dark world. So, we have a common threat now. Both Spamton and Jevil have most likely come into contact with Gaster at some point. In Jevil's case, he ended up learning about the true nature of the world as a game, and in Spamton's case, he must have learned something similar, or at least was taught on how to exploit that to his benefit. But that exploit only worked for so long. And in the face of him being stuck in a world where he doesn't get a say in things, he didn't try to just go along with it like Jevil did, but he did everything he could to try to spite it. And for the normal route at least, that is everything I can really say about Spamton. He is yet another character made victim to knowledge beyond what he could handle, and we can say with decent certainty at the moment that Gaster played a part in that like he did with Jevil. We still can't really parse why though, or what he exactly did or said to either of them that would leave them in the state that they ended up being in, but it was enough to completely shift her perspective Flashing of the world in warning. some okay. way or another. More to come. And with that... The next thing I can talk about is what happens when you give the second Shadow Crystal to Sham, as I do find it worth noting. First off, they imply that they do actually know about Spampton, or at least are familiar with him, as they refer to him as that salesman, which would make sense, as we know at least that Jevil and Spampton know each other, so maybe Sham just knows of him by proxy. They make their own okay. comment as well about the old machine being Metaton's work, and then when talking to them after they take the second crystal, they tell you that the next secret boss might be impossible to win against without the Shadow Mantle, which Sham should have, but they seem to have had it taken from them. And they imply that if it stays that way, then at two shadow crystals they'll remain. Which is... worrying, but I'll give my thoughts on this later. That is pretty much everything to do with shadow crystals shadow though, in Deltarune. Mantle. There's only a few of them so far, and the common thread seems to be that in the dark world they show a glimpse of where they would be in the light world, while in there, as a glass shard, it shows an altered version of the light world, and in both cases a rather grim alteration. Ugh. I mean, that might be literally why it's called a shadow crystal, it's rather dark. And that would be everything in Chapter 2. That totally would be. But I've been holding off a very specific part of this chapter that I'm going to finally delve into now. Weird route! Deltarune's whole thing at the very beginning was that your choices did not matter. It did not matter in Chapter 1 how you approached fights, how you handled certain dialogue, what kind of vessel you made, what you did in the light world, whether you fought Jevil. The game would end the same way, ultimately, and the very most that would change is just the attitude of some of the people in the dark world, but nothing outright horrible, just either, oh, we're nices now, or, oh, you're actually mean, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> for a while, we were to assume that this would be the same case for Chapter 2. In the not short but not horribly long time frame where you only have Noelle with Chris, there is a way to actually kill enemies in the cyber world using her ice shock attack. Thanks to her lack of knowledge about how dark worlds work, or how the combat in general works, and through picking a few particularly manipulative dialogue choices that lead to her following what you say, under the impression that Chris just wants her to get stronger, your journey through the cyber world can very quickly turn into a bleak one with much more concerning consequences and implications than even the light world. <laughs> Culminating in Noelle killing Birdly, using the attack that gives this alternate route its most common name, the Snowgrave route. For this video, I would be referring to it as the Weird Route, as I assume that this won't be the only chapter where this kind of thing can happen, and I believe that this is what the game refers to this route as internally. Either that, or Side B, although the mention of Side B only appears in one object in the game, to my knowledge, where Weird Route seems to pop up a little more frequently. 
There oh, okay. is absolutely no way I can make this video without talking about the weird route because in a meta context, this is pretty much a giant sequence break. It doesn't feel like it should be possible, but it is. What is otherwise a playthrough of the chapter that lasts from at least 5 to up to 7, maybe even 9 hours, is now down to just over 2 or 3 hours. Major sections are skipped or otherwise cut down, lore dumps are glossed over, character development happens off screen, and a major character <laughs> to the chapter straight up fucking dies, so there's quite a bit that's cut out of the picture. I still remember first hearing about this route when Chapter 2 came out and people genuinely did not believe it existed just from reading a summary of it, and yet, it was real. I think I remember seeing that tweet. Oh god, those early days, they were something else, weren't they? And I can't help but feel like that was kind of the intention. And actually, before I continue on, it's kind of hit me as I've been doing nothing but talking about Deltarune and meta shit and spammed in for who knows how long <laughs> now. This part especially has been kind of a lot at once, and I feel like the pacing has been a little wild. Hopefully not bad or too fast or anything, yeah, but there's fine. just been a lot to cover, and I feel inclined to keep rushing through it, but we're effectively halfway through the series as a whole at this point. So how about we take it a little slower for a bit? I think this is what they call an intermission, except not really, I just need an excuse to indulge for a few minutes and illustrate what I think is one of Deltarune's most important themes. And it's not quite just escapism. What do you mean by that? When I was editing half Red's part of the Delta cast months ago, there was this part that stuck out to me where there was an association made between Noel and glitch hunting and, you know, just the idea of creepy video game stuff in general. And I think it's honestly a good way to embody just what I think the weird route is before I get to really talking about it. So, uh, how about I let him cook for a bit just cuz before I give my own perspective on this side of things and on the route in general going forward. We've gotten in the um, Spamton ARG about Noelle is that she used to run a video game glitches and like rumors blog essentially. Yep. And mm -hmm. so she is like she was doing that for her entire childhood. And then when you take her to the Spamton door in the Snowgrave route, which opens essentially like you're finding a glitch, you have to do this really counterintuitive series of steps. She calls that door nostalgic, which someone in my chat pointed out could be a reference to her feeling nostalgic for her days glitch hunting in these sort of creepy video games. So, like, Noelle is very strongly associated with, like, creepypastas, video game glitches, that, that whole culture at this point. The glitch hunting thing is tied back to Gaster, too. True. Which is because that's how you yeah. find Gaster in the first place. Yeah. What with the fun values? It's extremely meta because essentially yeah. what we have here is we have all these ideas of glitch hunting and video game creepypasta culture being brought up. In, in, a, a, video in a video game, game yeah. I find it kind of fascinating how much the Deltarune fandom especially exploded after Chapter 2's release and how it wasn't just during the wake of Spamton, but of the Weird Route itself. One of the main things I think people felt kind of unsure about in regards to Deltarune was Toby's still even now continued insistence on the game only having one ending. And yet, despite having never been advertised publicly in the game, having never been acknowledged by Toby to this day, and having almost no hint to this route in the playable game aside from, I don't know, maybe one thing that Lancer said if you bother to check your inventory when they've all joined the party, the weird route is still one of the most often discussed topics of the game. Maybe not to casual players, but my point stands. And I really need to double down on this statement. The weird route was never advertised by Toby. There is no mention or allusion to the Weird Route in any of the store pages for the game. Secret bosses have been advertised, yes, maybe the eggs were never directly advertised and are more out of the way, but they feel just embedded enough in the game in a natural way that doesn't make you really question how it's even a thing, it's simply an easter egg. But when I think about the Weird Route, I think about what Toby said way back when people were data mining Undertale and the sentiment he must have had in the ballpark of feeling like games can never have secrets simply hiding in them anymore. It's always dug up from the files now, without full context, without the reward of learning about these secrets by word of mouth, not being sure how to get to them, but knowing a guy who knew a guy who vaguely remembers how to do it, and has a fuzzy memory of it, but was sure that it existed and was attainable if they just looked hard enough. The art of video game and generally playground and internet rumors in some ways is kind of dead now because information has become so much easier to access. Inherently, yeah. thanks to the modern internet, but in the past years tenfold, thanks to the landscape of theorizing and game analysis specifically coming down to, here's what we found in the files, and if it's not in the files, then it doesn't exist, so it can't ever be true. Oh yeah, that, 
Again, so many eras are now dead thanks to the ease of gathering information. However, this finality of existence or non-existence wasn't really always a thing, was it? There was a point in time where it was easier to tell stories of what might be, of what could be. The Bigfoot in San Andreas, the Mew under the truck, or maybe the Missing Nose, instantly oh, yeah. getting the ray gun in Black Ops Zombies, the tall faceless man in the suit, and perhaps even the spirit inhabiting an uncanny Link statue in an old Zelda game, or the kind of weird looking Tails doll in that one Sonic racing game everyone kept bashing back in the day when most of the YouTubers I used to watch then yet share political opinions that age like fucking milk. <laughs> Point is, whether you simply call them rumors, or creepypastas, or just glitches, the weird ride harkens back to this time a lot for me. The effort I made mean, to have people assume initially that the game was going to have only one ending, only to leave this in, knowing for sure people were going to find it on their own and spread the word on their own, is about the closest I have gotten to that feeling in a while. A long one at that. The slightest feeling that perhaps not all rumors are simply rumors, but that some of them just might be true. If you're about as old as I am, or maybe even a bit older, it is nostalgic, isn't it? Maybe it takes you back to when video games felt more grandiose in their nature, if you will. When your imagination could run wild as you not only pulled through the games you did, but also explored every inch of your favorite games. Replaying them countless times, digging as deep as possible into them, trying to find secrets that may or may not be there, but it didn't matter whether they were or not, what mattered was that you were curious. And that curiosity may have faded over time, as it naturally does, for better or worse. Yet, Deltarune feeds on that curiosity. Deltarune encourages it, even. Not quite in the sense of exhausting outcomes like Undertale, no, this is different. It feeds on the nostalgia for finding things that may or may not be there, even if you end up merely chasing shadows. Yes, the developer may have said that the game only has one ending, but that's just on the surface. Everything else is there for you to find on your own. And it always feels like there's still something we haven't quite found yet, even when you do data mine the game. You might have noticed in this part I've been rambling more about the lore of the game than in part 1. One reason for it, really, is that part 1 already covered a lot of the super meta stuff that piqued my interest, and part 2 has just been following up on those things more than it was adding completely new elements to the table. But aside from that, there's many things about the lore that do tie into it. If the meta stuff was simply to illustrate that the mechanics are in place for these themes to be expressed efficiently, right now I'm trying to show you what those themes even are. Everyone's talked a lot about the game through the lens of escapism and creating fiction as a means to cope with reality, but I think another potential cornerstone of the game's thematic foundation is nostalgia and curiosity. And I think Chapter 2 focuses on this especially as it challenges the preset linearity that the game set you up to expect over its full course. And so, it's an interesting dichotomy that has now been established in the game's meta narrative to me. While as far as we know, the game will have the same ending no matter what, and even if there's plenty of evidence or ways to technically prove or disprove the possibility for certain things to happen, you just can't help but ask yourself. Don't you miss exploring? Yeah. Don't you miss the playground rumors? Sure, the thought of not knowing everything and something potentially sinister or completely malign hiding somewhere in your favorite game or media is scary, but is the complete finality that we have such easy access to now to remove all that mystique really much better? Is it not simply more interesting to dig into everything about a thing you like, even if it might not be inherently part of the intended experience? Even if it might break some things in the process? This is what I think the Weird Route illustrates, and especially highlights. Deltarune encourages you to find secrets in itself, and the Weird Route to me is the absolute most extreme application of that. Not just going off the beaten path, but finding an entire loophole to both forge your own path and mold the already laid out one into something completely different. Something much more bizarre, with no help, no guidance on if you're even supposed to be able to do this, if this is even meant to be real. And with the fact that the character, who is a known glitch hunter, is the one responsible for this route even being possible, I think it's only natural that a character of that sort is the channel through which we are now forced to lay our nostalgia and curiosity bare for the game to see, and to break itself down upon. Oh god. You know, I'm just thinking. Yeah, I just thought. Like, the potential for more, you know, weird roots to pop up, would they be with different characters, like Chris pushing them to, you know, break, basically, you know, break the game, so to speak, or would it only ever be with Noelle? Like, doing the weird roots 
if future weird roots do exist. Like, would they be something that you can just do at any time if you do things in the right order? Or would they specifically require that you do the chapter 2 weird root, do the chapter 3 weird root, do the chapter 4 weird root, you know, etc, etc. And the potential, well, I mean, actually thinking about it, given that it's, that the chapter 3 is most likely going to be happening in our own home in the middle of the night, I doubt Noelle is going to show up in that chapter. I'm very much imagining, you know, obviously Toriel, uh, as well as uh, most uh, Undyne and the other police officers, maybe. Maybe even Asgore, since he was a former, the former chief, might still have connections in the police force. Oh god, all the glitches. Like, it, maybe that's just it. Like, the weird route in chapter 4 is even weirder than chapter 3, because you just pull Noelle out of thin air, and then she's there, and then she's all confused, like, ah, it's another dream! And you'll see soon enough that I think a lot of the themes in this game, in fact, do tie back around to Noelle, or at least to Des. And the weird route, and its sheer lack of any hints or advertising for it beforehand, goes to show for me that Deltarune knows exactly what it's doing. It's not just hiding secrets. Deltarune lives in secrets, in what could be. Secrets, after all, turn to rumors, and rumors turn to fiction. You can see this in many smaller ways, between the very obtuse way you find Chapter 1's egg especially, <laughs> or the secret bosses, or even that creepy smile in the Queen's basement that you could have sworn you saw for a split second. <sighs> but the weird route's very nature especially, is shrouded in darkness. Just like how, for a time, all of those same mysteries and creepypastas and glitches were once shrouded in that same darkness, like some of us might wish it still was. Especially when that was at its peak and the scope of internet horror was much different, it was easier to believe that kind of stuff. Or maybe I was just a dumb kid. I don't know. Like, this- You gotta be more easy on yourself. Things were better back then. This was the age where I was afraid of Slenderman finding me in my sleep, and I actually thought I saw him once. Or at the age where I was obsessed with Tails doll summoning videos, and back when Mudahar used to make haunted gaming vids. Man. But regardless, the existence of this route completely subverts the expectations and established meta-narrative that Chapter 1 appeared to be setting up, and it adds a lot of potential depth to what Deltarune could be really getting at. In Undertale, the existence of a pacifist and no-mercy route made sense as it was meant to be a way of subverting the expectations of how people are used to playing RPGs, questioning what really constitutes completing a game and being happy with it, and making sure it did everything it could to remind you that this is not a game where you are above consequences. The routes all played into each other well, and each one served their own purpose to the game's meta-narrative. So, for a game like Deltarune to start by making sure you thought it was like Undertale, just to pull a psych on you and give you complete whiplash with something totally new and hammering this point in if your choice is not meaning anything, only to actually give you the option to do a route like this if you really went out of your way to look for it, is a hell of a curveball. But at the yeah, very yeah, least, so. I do want to take a look at this route, note all the things that I think really stand out that may be relevant to more meta stuff, which is probably gonna be a fucking majority of it, but you know, and just leave it at that. We have no idea still where the hell this kind of route will go from chapter two, but I- Also, we, we're not entirely sure whether or not, uh, like, Birdley's actually dead. That's kind of important. <laughs> he might, at the very least, just have severe brain damage. I think there's no harm in gathering any relevant info from it anyway. So let me start with the general gameplay loop of this route. Okay, off script, I know I keep saying route and route interchangeably. I don't know which one it is. Is it route or route? I don't know, poke me in the comments or something about it if it matters, because I have, I have no fucking idea. Route, route. I've always, I think most of the time, I just go with root, but it's spelled R-O-U-T-E. You know, it's, um... Route? Yeah, I just stick with root. I have no respect for this goddamn language, honestly, I'm not gonna lie to you. When starting a weird route, the whole chapter up until you meet Noelle on your own is completely identical, so we can just skip through all of that. Once you meet Noelle though, and have her on your party, you're able to begin the route as soon as you use Ice Shock for the first time. You freeze your first enemy and you hear a very ominous jingle that pretty much trailheads the weird route. The first step here is pretty much just freezing every enemy you come across in Cyber City, as you notice her health actually goes up a bit with each encounter that she freezes. It may also be worth noting that you were able to bring Noelle to the door to Spamton's shop, and she comments on it being creepy, yet also nostalgic. When the second Weird Route jingle plays, then using this video as reference, this would be once you clear every enemy in the trash zone, the roads stop having cars, and now there's more enemies for you and Noelle to freeze. After killing a few more, a third jingle plays, and now even the stats menu changes, with Chris and Noelle having very bare-bones descriptions. 
Chris having the title of leader and the description, commands, and Noelle with the title of Frostmancer who freezes the enemy. Notably, she is level 2 at this point where normally she would be at level 1 as a snowcaster with a description might be able to use some cool moves. <laughs> the first annoying mouse room also provides the first opportunity of very cool Sigma-based them be moments from Chris, or rather, yourself, although you do not need to do this in order to carry out the weird route, it's not mandatory. Normally, you just push this block to the appropriate spot so no one can catch up to you, but through repeatedly rocking down to the exit, you get the first of many dialogue prompts that simply just read, proceed. This being an option Proceed, that pops up many yeah. times in later conversations with Noelle, but we'll get to them shortly. While this isn't necessarily important to the weird route, it certainly is out of character enough that I'd consider it part of that ballpark. Because even if not required for this route, Noelle still comments on how bossy that was of Chris, a central point of this route being just forcing your will upon them and making them act extremely out of character just so you can force a different outcome. Moving on, the study continues to be ever slightly more empty than before, with a noticeable lack of characters like most of the Addisons at this point in the route. A fourth jingle now plays once you get to the room with the Ferris wheel lad after killing every enemy up to that point. And this sad is where another very very worrying interaction can happen, I believe similarly not mandatory but still stands out where you can select I will ride with you, and then Noelle will ride with me, to her understandable concern, just shrugging it off as a prank. Then you talk to the Addison near the ferris wheel ad and tell them that you and Noelle are not friends but something else and this is where they tell you about the freeze ring and that Noelle can't get stronger without good equipment. You can say, get it, only to come up one dark dollar short. And then a few more times, Noelle realizes you're asking her to get it, and after pretty much forcing her through insistence, she kills the Addison, and you get the freeze ring. This is also one of a few instances where she's basically trying to convince herself that she didn't do anything and that nothing actually bad happened. She uh -huh. continues to do this, the bracketed dialogue implying that she's thinking to herself and not saying this stuff out loud. And then you're given a dialogue choice to tell her that her thoughts of getting Chris zapped are either horrible or natural. And this is definitely worth noting meta-wise since it's the first instance of the game acknowledging the fact that the player is able to read other characters' thoughts and said characters actually getting kind of freaked out by that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, Grant, I haven't gone through, uh, like, the weird route. Um, purely just because I couldn't be bothered, I'm I'm a little too lazy. But still, I mean, it, it, that really does kind of point out the whole thing that yeah, uh, Chris or at least the player can read other people's minds. And this eventually leads into Noelle realizing that she's hearing a voice that is definitely not Chris's. The fifth jingle now plays, and at this point, the city now plays a slower version of its theme. You continue to kill enemies, and the save points even change their flavor text. Now saying that you and Noel were filled with power. Enemies start running away from you when they spot you now rather than towards. Any signs that used to stop cars are now frozen as there's no need for them anymore. And when you go down to where the fake out game over and second egg used to be, instead you're met with a closed dumpster with Spamton hiding inside of it. He actually enables you to continue going down this route as he implies he has a deal for you if you kill more enemies, telling you specifically how many you're still missing. When you reach the second and third mouse puzzles, there's more very awesome and based interactions that, uh, proceed to take place, pretty much brute forcing yeah. through both puzzles. As Noelle struggles to deal with her coping mechanism of blinking any memories of her actions thus far from her recollection completely. A sixth and seventh jingle play at these puzzles respectively. And after killing all the enemies in the room after, you'll have met all the requirements for Spampton's deal, which for 1997 Cromer, you get the Ring of Thorns. Which makes Noel take damage while wearing it, down to 55 HP, but reduces the cost needed to cast Ice Magic. And finally, the main event, or at yes, least one yes, of the two mm. main events, the fight with Birdly. Noelle just sees Birdly as another enemy at first before giving a thousand yard stare at him, and after another Sigma Envy moment, the fight begins with Noelle urging Birdly to run away. Again, I, out of all the times I've seen somebody play this route, I've I never noticed before, I th I'm forgetting what video it was, I think it was like the previous Deltarune reaction I, wa I was watching or something, but like I had never noticed that Noelle is just like... She looks, like, completely frozen and just completely out of it here. Oh. Oh, this route. Oh, God. You know, for some reason, this makes me feel so much worse than, like, the genocide route in Undertale. And maybe it's because you're forcibly dragging somebody else along for the ride. The music is much more simple, more intense than it would be originally, and even where Chris is down, Noelle doesn't listen to Birdly because she still hears the player's voice. And once you reach max TP, you're able to use a new spell. Snowgrave, which is just described as fatal. Noelle insists that she doesn't know what that spell is, she doesn't know what you're talking about, but eventually snaps at you and does it anyway just because you wanted to see it so badly. And then...
Yep. Noelle just asks what happened, completely blinking on what she just did only a few seconds ago before leaving through the upper alley and going back to her room in the mansion. You go up that same path which immediately just sends you to the entrance to Queen's Mansion as you regroup with Susie and Raze. Susie notices pretty quickly that Chris looks upset, which I think goes without explaining as to why, but it's yeah. shook off pretty quickly and at this point the sequence break part of the route really kicks into full gear because what the fuck. The mansion is totally barren as things like Susie's ultimate healing and the lore surrounding certain darkners not belonging in other dark world is explained very unceremoniously. Instead of the usual music playing, now Deal Gone Wrong plays throughout the mansion as you find out the butlers are holed up somewhere and the queen is nowhere to be even found. You also learn that the strange force that's taken over is Spampton as he's changing forms down in the basement, thanking Yo and Noel for giving him the opportunity to do so, only specifying that he sure hopes no one tries to steal the fountain. I don't have much to say about the yeah. mansion up until the very end, honestly, other than some things are altered, like you fight Mouse Wheel, Task Manager, and Wereware Wire in different rooms, and the table puzzle is now just a peepus maze. That I swear peepus that word. That is literally it, I think. But the next notable part is when you're near Noelle's room. Susie asks Chris to go with her to save Noelle, but Chris doesn't say anything, and you don't get any choice to make Chris say anything either. Rosley does the thing he usually does when Susie's off on her own, asking if Chris wonders what Susie is doing, but again, no response. Which could be taken as Chris trying to keep the player's perspective away from Susie as much as possible now. Although, Rosley then says, You're right, Chris. It has only been 30 seconds. Which, it could have one of two meanings, because this is yet another instance of Rousey to me just being kind of weird. On top of me yeah. already mentioning that this moment pretty much results in Susie coming back and Rousey trying to learn what happened, only for Susie to shrug it off and say she'll explain it later, which prompts Rousey to be probably more caught off guard than in any other moment in the game. I feel like him saying this could either mean that Chris told him that it's only been 30 seconds, which could be possible because we never hear Chris's voice. But I also wonder if, assuming he's just referring to the player here and not Chris, that he takes the silence from the player as a response of that sort. Susie also seems very eager to move on, and I can't help but wonder if she's just trying to get going with stopping Queen, or if even with what she told about what happened that there's something about her conversation with Noelle that made either of them uncomfortable. But you continue on yeah. having completely skipped that sequence and also skipped the Queen boss fight altogether as she notes that Noelle isn't in a condition to help her now, and she can't find Birdly anywhere. All of the important lore you get here regarding the roaring as such is completely glossed over. <laughs> Susie then goes to see Noelle again before you leave to seal the fountain, and I think there's a pretty strong implication here that Noelle is just dead asleep in her room at this point after everything that happened, or at least that there's something that was left out in whatever Susie said about Noelle in her room, but anyway. You go to seal the fountain, and so the other main event happens. The mandatory fight against Spampton Neo as he's pissed at you for trying to seal the fountain and breaking whatever alliance he thought he had with you. And so the fight starts. And there's well, a lot time, of dialogue that Spamton throws out that's unique to this fight, one bit being, you've been making, haven't you? You've been making Hyperlink Blocked. Which I think adds further to my best guess that when he mentions Hyperlink Blocked, it must be referring to control or also likely freedom or possibly even power? Could power be a potential mechanic similar to how determination is, in the sense that having more of it just gives you more control over reality? I mean, aside from the save point Maybe. mentioning that you're just filled with power, it does say you're otherwise filled with the power of something, and that power is what regenerates your HP and what lets you save. Hell, the song that's used when you're stealing fountains is called Your Power. And that's a second potential video to make about Deltarun, aside from talking about stats. Oh, Jesus wonderful. Christ, man. The fight doesn't have anything of note until his defense phase when you're unable to leave a dent in him until you try acting. It starts with just blank prompts showing Rousey or Susie's icons saying that nobody came when Chris tried to call for their help. And then you get to Noelle's icon, where it's not Chris calling for help, it's you whispering Noelle's name. While there are instances of the game using you and Chris interchangeably, it's pretty universally agreed upon that this is a case where the distinction is likely very intentional. <laughs> that would be funny. Like you're, <laughs> you're, it, it, like you're in the light world. You use the thing to heal Chris, and then you like subconsciously just take a sip, and it's like, and that's how Chris was healed. Like you took a sip. Spamton scolds you at first for it before. Yeah, here he is. <sighs> yeah, sorry, there's a lot of moments in this chapter that I think are just better left without summary. 
Yeah, Back just... in the light world, Noelle wakes up and she recounts some of what happened with Susie. And Birdly doesn't wake up. She just shrugs it off as exhaustion and him resting a bit and then quickly leaves. There's only a few things that should really be mentioned at this point. Going to Castletown is just kind of depressing as Queen is one of the only people who really make it there since, well, you fucking killed everyone else and the fact that this route makes Queen actually kind of upset is good enough reason for me to never want to play it myself. Mm -hmm, and the last yeah. thing I can really go over now is what happens when you go to the hospital. The interaction mostly plays out as normal, but slightly altered so that now Noelle doesn't want to give Rudy control over her game to him, and once you leave the room, Rudy asks to have a word with Susie, and Noelle keeps convincing herself that what happened was just a dream, a but dream, yeah. can't help but feel like it was too real to not be something else. And she becomes aware of a voice that was telling her what to do, one unlike Chris's. And she catches on to how weird Chris has been acting in general and wants to figure out why. You get a dialogue choice saying that you wanted to see Noelle or just her father. Either way, she gets startled, and after she tries to assure herself that it was just a dream, even after hearing your voice again, you get the choice to either say nothing or that it wasn't actually a dream. Susie walks in, and Noelle, again, quickly leaves. There's other things that are unique to this scene as well, like her noticing that you have her watch if you ever equipped it on Chris in the Dark World. Oh god, yeah, I am the weird room is just going to be a whole bunch of, like, psychological trauma that we're going to just, you know, do to everybody, isn't it? Again, thinking back to my whole I, prediction wish about being able to, like, actually talk with Chris, I have a feeling that's going to be, if that actually happens, that would be one of those sticking points that would come up, um, uh, the weird route specifically, if we ever got the chance to actually talk with them. Or the fact that this is the only scene so far where you have player control outside of this dialogue box, and you can step towards Noel to skip to the later bit of her dialogue, then again to make her tell you to stop getting closer, and then one more time to just dismiss the scene entirely. And... that's the weird route. The game ends the same way even if you go through this route in its entirety, although there are plenty of moments throughout the weird route where you are able to abort it, whether by selecting a different dialogue choice, or choosing to spare Birdly, or use anything other than Snowgrave on him to deplete his health. <laughs> in this case, everything pretty much goes back to normal, and the game progresses through the normal route again, and a new jingle plays as a cue of this. That's but the other than that, that is honestly everything I can say about it. Hell, honestly, that's kind of a wrap for this part of the analysis overall. What a fucking ride. <laughs> this chapter has been incredibly dense. I'm adding some of this in last minute because in the rush of trying to just get through all these topics, I've realized how easy it is to forget to know when to wrap things up proper because I didn't want to stretch this video's runtime any longer than it already is. I think where chapter 1 gave me a lot of room to focus on some of the more meta parts of the game, chapter 2 was mostly following up on those things, but also adding so many things to the table that we can't even begin to fully understand in the bigger picture, to the point that I felt I had no choice but to go kind of rapid fire with some of what I talked about. Yeah, just thinking about it, chat with her video, I mean, chapter two is very much like, it's like you, you like you got a whole, it, like you're doing a puzzle and you've gotten a whole bunch of pieces, but they're pieces from literally every, but they're only a handful of pieces that are literally scattered from everywhere else on the board. And there's virtually no way of connecting them to the others without finding the pieces that go in between first. We have five more chapters and there are those pieces we need. <laughs> There's god knows how many ways to go from here on, and as it stands, with only two chapters out for us to play, we're at yet another cliffhanger. Chapter 1 may have established the game's themes of control and how that influences a player protagonist's dynamic and the dissonance between us and Chris, but Chapter 2 really nailed that theme in like nothing else. Chris has been given a lot more moments to be able to act and do things on their own accord and to get in the way of some of our actions, and likewise we have had many more opportunities to completely break the order of things and, if you really wanted to, impose your will on Chris to the point of using them to manipulate their friends into much more concerning circumstances. Yeah. And yet, despite all of that, at the end of the day we have a similar deal as with Chapter 1's ending. 
hint of normalcy, only for it to be disturbed as Chris pulls out the soul a few more times to steer things in her favor so that Susie can stay at their house. By getting Toriel to invite her over after slashing her tires and getting her to call the police later at night, before they wake up in the dead of it, pull the soul out, open the door, turn on the TV that they had plugged in the night before, and take one last look at Susie before stabbing the floor with their blade, creating a dark fountain of their own, before putting the soul back in and sleeping once more, as we see a smile form on the TV and roll credits. That's where we are now, and I imagine we'll be here for a good while still. And while yeah. we do have more evidence of trends regarding the meta side of things, and in the secrets and easter eggs in general, we still have so, so many questions and gray areas that have left people at each other's throats for the past few years now as to what it all means. Frankly, oh my God, I'm I still see. not even fully confident in some of my findings. After all, it's only really set in sun once we see some of these supposed trends carried across maybe three or more chapters. But with the second one being a sort of foundation for future ones to be built off of, it does give me more confidence than I might have had initially with only one chapter to work with. And furthermore, the sheer volume of what was found in Chapter 2 puts the first one to bed, honestly. Even what we learned internally, and with the eggs and Rouse gives us so much to work with. And Spamton alone has so much depth to him in relation to the fourth wall and meta fuckery that I had to dedicate a whole segment within a segment to him, and how he contributes to the meta narrative and how secret bosses in general complement or contrast it. And that's not even going to the break it in half. As for that, we have no idea how the hell this plays into the meta narrative, honestly, because of just how out of the blue it was when it was first discovered. And we also have no clue how this is going to affect later chapters or just how future weird roots might unfold until we actually get more content for Deltarune in I don't know, at least like five or six months from now or something. And really, yeah. So that being said, this video came out eleven months ago. Um, still no Deltarune chapter three and four yet. Mm. For Deltarune's demo as a whole, there's only a few things that I might not have mentioned, that being stuff in the code perhaps? Such as how the parent object for monster data in the game appears to be named Echidna, referencing the Greek monster of legend, which is a pretty interesting way to tie in its function as a parent object. And to quickly explain in game maker terms what that means, that's just the kind of object that you can link to different children objects, and what that does is, whatever code and traits you put in the parent object, the children objects can inherit those same traits and it overwrites some of it with their own unique data. And that's what seems to be happening here with Echidna and it being linked to Darkner data in general, but I don't know how that fits into things at the moment other than it being a super obscure and more recent discovery. And there's also all the weird as fuck text for the error handlers in the game, which is also in parent objects for things such as interactable objects and what have you. I'll link the respective videos from Halfbred about Echidna and these error handlers elsewhere if you want a deeper look at it yourself, but it is very strange. Hmm. Stuff like your eyes became blurry and emptiness filled your hands, or suddenly your body seizes up. What are you looking at? As if the flavor text is commenting on the fact that you shouldn't be seeing these objects at all to begin with. Got it, I forgot about the manual too, fuck. Rousey has this manual that he gives you in chapter 1, but you're never able to read it. At least in game, you're not able to. The pages of the manual are actually in the data, and there's some unused features mentioned in there, like the dog option in the battle section, or a talk function for the overworld menu that we never actually see. And even that has scripts for it in the code what? that go unused, and its error handling really? text, or just using it on invalid targets, just says, your voice echoes aimlessly. And there's also this weird-ass poem and some other error handlers? Like, fuck man, you tell me what to make of this because even with everything I've covered, I am completely at a loss for these lines. I'd argue these almost go in the same kind of ballpark as the unused scripts maybe, where maybe we might get some context for these later, and I can't imagine a scenario where you'll actually see some of this error handler text <laughs> intentionally if you find some way to break the game so to speak in a way that's by design or part of some weird route, but I am throwing completely baseless shots at this point. Oh god, what if- wait, maybe that's it. Maybe future Weird Roots won't be- like, they won't be dark and, like, they were here where you're, like, taking control of, um, of, um, Chris to the point of, like, you know, forcing his friends to do stuff. Maybe future Weird Roots actually, you know, by the name, get really weird and they actually involve you playing through, like, uh, playing through, like, error messages or something. Oh, okay. And that is it for now, unfortunately. This is, of course, a part of a much larger reaction, so link to the next part should be appearing, you know, somewhere over my face, as well as uh, in the corner of the video. I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you in the next part. So yeah.